Good afternoon, good evening, good night to everyone. Good evening, good night to everyone. I want to uh, welcome you guys, those of you that are watching live and perhaps will be watching uh, when this broadcast is finished to um, just somewhat of an outlet um, that I kind of felt led to just design really to get the word of God out. Um, and I really feel like social media, you know, a lot of times people, they get on social media for a multiplicity of different reasons and purposes. Um, but, um, my aim and my goal is to simply get on to share the pure and unadulterated word of the living God. So if you're hungry like I am for truth, for inspiration, for revelation, for confirmation, uh, I pray that uh, this particular venue and this particular outlet would serve those needs. Amen. Not by my nor by power, but by my spirit, say the Lord of hosts. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for giving me this time uh, to allow God to speak in your hearts and in your, in your ears. I'm not going to uh, prolong this. I will try my best to be very brief with this. But before I get into the topic, as you can see, the topic is known as or called the breathing book coming out of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. So you can go there whilst I say this little piece. Uh, as you can see, if you hadn't already noticed, this is not coming from my original Facebook profile. This is a separate page um, that uh, I kind of crafted and designed. Uh, and it is for the purpose of just sharing the word of God. It's not for any ulterior motive or anything like that. It's just to really share God's precious word. So let's get into the word. Let's go to 2 Timothy 3 and 16, and I'll explain what it is that the Lord has dropped into my heart. And I pray that this word is a blessing to those that hear it in Jesus' name. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. I'm actually going to read verses 16 and 17 to stay within context. The Bible says these words. I'm reading out of the King James, and then I'm going to go and switch over and I'll read out of the NIV. The Bible says, um, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now let's go over, I'm going to read it in the NIV because I like how it phrases it. It says here, um, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so, as I was reading the scripture today, the Holy Spirit, He pointed out one specific phrase to me, and that was the phrase, God breathed. God breathe, God breathe, God breathe. Uh, in the King James, that is known as inspiration, but in the NIV, it says God breathe. And inspiration, when you look it up even deeper into the, the Hebrew and even uh, just the, 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 the valued meaning of that particular word, you will see that that word has to deal with literally the breath of God, the breath of God. So literally, uh, we are holding in our hands and we have possession of God's breath. The word of God carries and was initiated by literally the breath of God. Uh, one thing about breathing is it empowers speaking. Breathing empowers speaking. So the spoken word of God had to be, had to be empowered by his very breath. The breath of God empowered uh, uh, the words of God to come to man. 
the breath of God empowered the words of God to come to man. The breath of God was the force behind the word of God that broke through uh, literally the realm of the spirit into the realm of flesh so that man can receive some type of concept of God, some type of direction from the Lord. Okay, so it is because of his breath that his word that his word moves to you. His breath moved his words to you. His breath moved his thoughts to you. His breath moved his concepts to you. So the word of God is empowered by his breath. And so hence the title, The Breathing Book. This book that we hold in our hand is alive. It is a breathing book instrument it is a breathing tool it is a living orgasmic tool that we live by all right so inspired means god breathed the bible is a breathing book now not only is the bible a breathing book but the bible is a book full of breath all right i know that seems simple but follow me it is a book filled with breath and this is how the holy spirit revealed it to me he said that this book is a book filled with the breath necessary for you to live it is the book filled with the breath necessary for you to live so uh when you come in to contact with the word of god you are coming into spiritual oxygen to live a spiritual life. This is the oxygen of heaven. Without the oxygen of heaven, you will not be able to live a heaven life or heaven type of life. So the word of God contains the breath necessary for you to breathe and live for him. And so this is what the Lord kind of put in my heart. He said, the devil wants us to live in a place of suffocation. The devil understands that you as a son or a daughter of God, if I can keep you away from the breath of heaven that is in the word of God, I can stop you from living and I can suffocate you from a place of existing and, and demonstrating the things of heaven. I can literally cut off your life source well, you're not demonstrating the word of God, but you're demonstrating my suggestions, my demon, demonic implantations, and the things that I would have you to do. So the enemy wants us to be in a place of suffocation where we do not come into contact with the breath that is necessary for us to live this God life. So the devil, he wants us to live in a place of suffocation. So what he does is he fights us from being able to access the oxygen suitable to live a spiritual life. The enemy wants to fight your access to get the tools you need to be able to operate the way God has called you to operate. The enemy can't do nothing about the availability of what God has given you. The word of God is available. The word of God is before you. But the enemy can do or he can try or he can fight your connection to it because you know if if you connect to the word you connect to your spiritual ox oxygen if you connect to the word you connect to the atmosphere necessary to empower you to live like they live up there see there's two different atmospheres there's the atmosphere of the earth and there's the atmosphere of heaven both atmospheres is empowered by a certain get this type of air both atmospheres operate under two different type of laws. The atmosphere of heaven operates under the law of the spirit. The atmosphere of the earth operates under the law of the flesh. The enemy understands that if I can stop you from, from, from coming into contact with the tools and the resources necessary to, to, to tap into the atmosphere in heaven, I can stop you from living the way heaven desires for you to live. I can stop you from demonstrating the way heaven desires for you to demonstrate, the way heaven desires for you to quote, to, to exist. So here's the thing. The enemy wants to stop your access 
from spiritual oxygen, from the spiritual oxygen of God's word. Now, I'm really speaking in parables. So, you know, the Holy Spirit is really going to begin to just really, you know, just release this. Let me read, let me read what I put down here. Many of us breathe spiritually once a week. Many of us, we breathe spiritually once a week. We take uh, heavenly oxygen less than we take worldly oxygen. So we breathe spiritually once a week. We take that, that, that breath of the word in church, or we take that breath of the word in Bible study, but we don't make a conscious effort to breathe in his word, his thoughts, his concepts, his atmosphere on a consistent and inconsistent basis. And whatever you breathe is what's going to empower you to live. If you breathe worldly, you will live worldly. If you breathe word, you will live word. So here's what I have in my notes here. A normal human takes about 30,000 breaths a day, 210,000 breaths a week, and about 680 million to about 500 million breaths in a lifetime. So why did I put those statistics there? Because if a human does not breathe consistently, they will not exist. If you don't breathe the breath of God consistently, you will not exist spiritually you will become spiritually dead, all right? Go to, go to Genesis chapter two, because I want to show you something that's really unique here. <clears throat> it's really, really unique here. In Genesis chapter two, verse seven, the Bible says something really amazing to me. I, I really think it's amazing, and the Lord really just showed this to me, and it was just, it really blew my mind. And in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, the Bible says, and the Lord, God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So God breathed into Adam and because God breathed into Adam, he was able to live. He was able to exist. Now, hear, hear me out. The breath of God was not just air. The breath of God was his very word. His word was placed in Adam. And that's what gave him the strength to be able to name all the animals. That's what gave him the strength to have super intelligence to be able to do that. So in his breath, it's not just air, but it's instruction, it's wisdom, it's, 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 it's life, it's direction, it's clarity, it's restoration, it's healing, it's everything that you need. Everything that you need is in his breath. Now, don't you find this interesting that God didn't take Adam and sit him down and tell him, I need you to name the giraffe a giraffe. I need you to name the zebra a zebra. I need you to name the lion a lion. All the pre-coded names were in the breath of God already. Some of you, you're trying to do everything for God. You're trying to do all kinds of stuff in your own strength, but all you need to do is receive divine CPR, receive the breath of God, because in his breath is the instructions encoded for your future. His breath has the instructions encoded for where you're trying to go. His breath has the instructions encoded for, to, to try to deliver you from the past and from the, inflict, the, 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 the afflictions and, 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 and the, the conflicts of your soul. In his breath is your deliverance and your durability. It is the thing that caused you to be free and stay free and free others. Now, here's something else. God breathed mouth to mouth with Adam. But how does God breathe into us? Does God come down and kiss us like Adam? No. God breathes into us, get this, by his word. We experience the same breath that Adam experienced in the garden, not, from, not through a mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation or not through a mouth-to-mouth -mouth contact, but we receive the same uh, 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 life of God through a mind-to-mind -mind contact. Adam received it from mouth to mouth. We receive it from mind to mind. 
Adam received the breath of God from God's mouth into his mouth. But we receive the breath of God from his mind, his word, into our minds. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the breath of God comes through his mind, his word, his thoughts, and it infiltrates our mind, our world, our thoughts. And it conforms our thoughts to his mind so that we can experience his manifestation. So Adam, he received the breath of God from mouth to mouth, from God's mouth to his mouth. We receive the breath of God from God's mind to our mind. Is your mind in position to receive his breath? Is your mind in position to receive his renewal? You ever notice when air is gone from something, it dies? But when air returns into an atmosphere, it becomes renewed? When Adam sinned, when Adam sinned and Adam departed from God, the air or the atmosphere of God left. And because the air and the atmosphere of God left, man was kicked into a dry place. Man was exiled into a dry existence. But Jesus came back and more importantly, the Holy Spirit came back and blew fresh air. The word of God came back and blew fresh air through the manifestation of Jesus Christ. And so all we have to do is subject our dry situations, our dry place, to a wet and to a, a, a moist God that is able to blow winds and, and, and release rain to bring that which was dead back to life. The breath of God. The breath of God. Now, here's the thing. I looked this up. It takes seven minutes without breathing or seven minutes suffocating to die. It takes seven minutes suffocating to die. All right. Here's what the Lord dropped into my heart and told me. He said, many of us as believers, we are suffocating six out of the seven minutes. And so we require a last minute resuscitation. We require a last minute resuscitation. We require the, the word of the Lord to come to us only in moments of emergency. Now we know the word of God functions in any type of climbing. The word of the Lord is functional in the times where you are desperate and you need God to do something right then and there. But the word of the Lord is, not, you do not need to limit the function of God's word to when times get bad. You need to allow the word of God to not just only flow in times when it's bad, but you need to allow the word of God to flow all the time on a consistent basis. Many of us, we only live the word through an emergency room experience. When we can't breathe anymore, when death is knocking on our door, when life is about to take us out, then we want to come in, in contact with the word and get fresh, fresh air. But God is saying, I don't just want you to inhale my word one time, but I want you to stay connected so that the word of God can go into you and you can constantly breathe of my word, breathe of my substance, breathe of my concept, because I am not coming to, I don't just want to come to resurrect you, get this, I want you to live off of your resurrection experience. Many of us, we get resurrected and we go right back into a death place. God is saying, I don't want you to go back to that death place, but I want you to stay connected to the source of your resurrection so you no longer have to be risen up, but you can walk in a risen existence. Aren't you tired of having to get up over and over and over again? Aren't you ready to be able to say, you know what, I fell, but now I'm walking and then I'm going to begin to run and I'm going to soar? No longer am I going to live in a low place. No longer am I going to be buried under the dirt of sin and under the dirt of past hurts and under the dirt of condemnation, under the dirt of fear. It is only going to come when you receive the resurrection power of his word and when you stay connected to the resurrection source. Because the Bible says in Acts 17, in him I live, in him I move, in him I have my being. Don't just have your resurrection, have your being. Don't just have a resurrection, have a being. That's good, Holy Spirit. Have a being. 
God doesn't want to just do something in you. He wants to produce a be out of you. See, there's a difference between do and be. Do deals with emergencies. Be deals with existence. Do deals with, I got to do a work in you because if I don't do a work in you, you're going to die. But after I do the work in you, I need you to be the fruit of the work that I did. I need you to continue in my word. Jesus said, he said that you will know if you're my disciples, if you do what? If you continue in my word, continue off of your resurrection experience from faith to faith, from glory to glory. Keep breathing. Keep breathing. Keep breathing. Keep breathing. Keep breathing. So you cannot live off of one breath. You need the sustained breathing of the word to live spiritually. You need the sustained breathing of God's word to live spiritually. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You need a continual reception of the spirit of God to live a spiritual life continually. See, the devil, he doesn't mind us taking one breath as long as we uh, uh, don't start breathing. See, there's a difference between a breath and breathing. Breath is a moment. Breathing is, 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 is when you transform a moment into something that is momentous. Breath is a moment. Breath is, oh, I took a breath. <sighs> but breathing is, <sighs> breathing is when you build off of a breath. See, the enemy, he don't mind you taking a breath on Sunday. He just don't want you to build off your breath. He don't want you to build off of what you receive in church. Because if you build off of your breath long enough, you become self-sufficient. Now you get strength to fight the enemy. Now you get strength to cast down strongholds. And not only that, now you get strength to cause life and breath to come into others. Ezekiel was sitting in the, in the, in the valley of the, the dry bones. Ezekiel had such breath in him, literally, that the wind of God took him into a valley. He was surrounded by the wind of God. And he told, God told Ezekiel, he said, Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? Ezekiel said, Lord, only you know. God said, prophesy. See, you, you, you want to be filled with the breath of God so much that you'll be able to command the breath of God to come not just, not just in your life, but into the lives of others to resurrect them. Ezekiel was able to command the breath of God to come into dry places and bring people from a place where they where, where literally they supernaturally resurrected from a place of death into life. Now, the resurrection of God is never incomplete. It's one thing to resurrect a dead person and they come up as a, a zombie. But when you resurrect someone that is dead and they come up as a full-grown man, that means they're not only just resurrected from a position of death to life, they're resurrected from a place of literally non-existence, get this, to maturity. See, when the breath of God hits you, it don't just hit you to pick you up. It, it, get this, it hits you up, it hits you to grow you up. The breath of God hits you not just to pick you up from a place of death, it hits you to grow you up from a place of non-existence. See, when people, people that get in the word of God, they move from milk to meat. They're not just dead in the spirit, but they come from a, from a place of death into a place of grown up, into a place of strength. It's like a person going from bony and dead to alive and muscular. God wants to take you from a place of bony and dead and disheveled to a place where you're alive and you're not just alive in, a, in the sense that you're surviving, but you're alive in the sense that you are maximizing your living state. You are maximizing the life that you're given. He said, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it, what? More abundantly. More abundantly. Now, an initial breath is marked by panic. With this breath, you are just trying to survive. Almost dying due to the lack of oxygen. Anytime... Anytime, if you've held your breath in for a minute or less, when you begin to open your mouth, the first thing you do is you gasp. <sighs> you don't have energy to say anything. You don't have energy to even look around who's around you. You don't have energy to make any movement. Your only uh, 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 um, uh, obsession is trying to catch your breath. And see, that's how a lot of us live in the church. We stay in a dead state. And then when we come to church, we try to catch our breath. We try to catch up with where God is at in one moment. 
God is saying, I don't want you to catch up. I want you to cruise. There's a difference between catching up and cruising. You catch up, you, and you go right back to that dead place. And you lose ground. And you get disconnected. So it's like you disconnect six days out of the week and the seventh day you try to reconnect. That's so you, you're just trying to keep it up, but you go right back to that place of disconnection. But if you stay in a place of connection, you don't have to catch up. You can cruise with him. You can cruise with God. <coughs> so when you are breathing in the word of God, it is meant to be a consistent experience. Not just a one-time thing, not just a weekly thing, but a daily, moment-to-moment, day-by-day experience. Now, don't breathe in the word of God as a means of survival. Don't breathe in the word of God as a means of survival. If you look at the word of God as a means of survival, that means you are, you are looking at the word of God, get this, through a selective lens. That means you're only delegating importance to the word of God in moments of emergency. I'm only going to pick up my Bible when things get bad. That's, that means you're looking at the word of God as a means of survival. I'm only going to pick up my Bible when, 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 when people are talking about me. I'm only going to pick up my Bible when I'm sick and I'm in the hospital. I'm only going to pick up my Bible when people at, the, at my job is, 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 is mocking me and saying all manner of evil things against me. Don't use the word of God based on conditions. But live the word of God and stay connected to the word of God uh, without even paying attention to, to, to uh, the conditions around you. So we don't need to prioritize the word of God based on our means to survive. We need to prioritize the word of God based on obligation, dedication, and connection. See, there's a difference between trying to survive and, 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 and being connected. Connection says... I choose to be connected just because I love you. Survival says, I'm going to be connected to you because I have a problem. Are you connected to the word of God because of an issue? Or are you connected to the word of God because of his image? Which one are you connected for? Why are you connected to the word of God? Are you connected to the word of God because you love him? Or because of what he can do for you in that moment? So God doesn't want us to just... uh, 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 just just come to church and just get a good breath or get a good fix and then go back to a place of breathlessness, go back to a place of suffocation, go back to a place of being connected to the word of God. He wants us to be continually in God's word. Because you see, you see the thing about continually breathing, you get strength to eventually think, walk, talk, and do everything else. Now, I studied this out. I studied this out. If you do CPR on an individual or a person, Usually it takes more than one breath to bring them back. Here's what most of us look like in the spirit. We're in a dead place, but we only want God to breathe in us one time. That's not enough to pick you up. You need to allow the word of God to continually breathe through you. Why? Because you want his breath, get this, you want his breath not to be placed in you, but you want his breath to be pumping through you. If I breathe into a person that has C, that, that, that is whatever, out or just drowned and they came out and, and they need CPR, if I breathe into them one time, that breath is not enough, in addition with the pressure that I have to put on their chest, it's not enough to pump out the problem, the thing that was stopping them from breathing. See, when the breath of God comes, it comes to, it comes to literally get something out of you so it can come in you, so it can pick you up. The breath of God comes, first of all, to attack the thing that has stopped you from breathing. And then once it has finished that enemy of breathing, it establishes, it establishes itself in you so you can breathe and eventually function. So it comes to attack the enemy of breathing, and then it comes in you to establish itself so that you can walk, you can talk, you can be who you're called to be. So if you just allow God to breathe in you one time, he may get some of that stuff out, but some of that stuff is still in there. The CPR position, the CPR procedure is not complete. But if you allow God to continually breathe into you to a point where he literally empties you out of everything that was trying to keep you in a suffocated place, of everything that was trying to keep you in a place where you couldn't breathe, where you couldn't proceed, where you couldn't pray, you 
submit yourself, get this, to a place and to a process called freedom. And that freedom begins to manifest in you to a point where you get up for where you are. You get up out of that low place. You get up out of that place called fear. You get up out of that place called bitterness. And now you can breathe past fear. You can walk past it. You can move forward in the things of God. God wants you to connect to his breath so you can move forward. He comes to breathe in you to restore your functionality, to restore your ability to do things, to restore your ability to live for him. Those of you that may have feel, felt, let, felt, felt left off or felt let, left out because you don't have a sense of purpose, the breath of God comes to restore purpose. It comes to resurrect the original call of God in your life. But you have to allow him to breathe in you. Because when he breathes in you, his breath in you will allow him to breathe through you. See, there's a difference between him breathing in you and breathing through you. Many of us, we just want him to breathe in us. But we don't submit to his breathing in so he can breathe through us. The sign of a healthy Christian is that they lose their sense of being and they take on his sense of being. The day that you know that you are healthy in God is when he can breathe through you. But when you, you say, okay, you're talking in parables, what do you mean by breathe through you? What I mean by that is when you get ready to say the bad word, instead of you saying the bad word, you say, God bless you. That's breathing. That's God breathing through you. When you get ready to, to do something wrong, instead of doing something wrong, you do something right. And you're like, wow, what happened? That's God breathing through you. When you get ready to submit to fear and, and, and condemnation and, and, and all kinds of demonic things, and all of a sudden the word of God stands up in you, that's God breathing through you. Submit to him breathing in you so he can breathe through you. Now, the devil always wants you to be in a place where you're forced to survive over and over, but you never cross into that true sustainment of life. He don't mind you getting a quick fix. He don't mind you getting that. But, 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 he just don't want you to stay under the remedy of the word long enough so you become self-reliant in God. He doesn't want you to experience independence in the spirit because he only deals with people that are needy. He only deals with people that are vulnerable and don't know what God says about them. So what kind of breath are you going to have? Are you going to have survival breath? Or are you going to have a breath that sustains itself, that keeps going? Survival, survival breath says, I almost died. Ooh, ooh, I almost died. That's survival breath. But sustained breath said, I'm living. Woo, I'm living. Because why? I keep breathing. I keep breathing. You have some people, they go to church. Every time they go up to the altar, every time they sit in church, they get a, a survival breath. Whew, this week was so bad. I almost died. Ooh, but thank God for the breath. That's good. But you have to learn how to keep breathing when you leave the church. Because if you don't, leave, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't keep breathing when you leave the church, then you walk back into the devil's realm of suffocation. You walk back into that place where you can't breathe. You walk back into that place called death, hopelessness. You walk back into that place called loneliness. You walk back into that place called fear, anxiety, anger, rejection, shame, condemnation, self-hatred, lack of discipline, lust, perversion. You walk back into that dark place. I don't want to keep switching conditions throughout the week where I, 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 I almost die. I almost die. And then I come to church and get life. And then I go back to a place of death. That's a cycle of torment. That's a cycle of torment. And God has not called us to a place of torment. He's called us to a place of thriving. But thriving will only manifest if you keep breathing. I'm here to tell somebody tonight, I know the situations is rough, but keep breathing. Keep breathing. And the beautiful thing about it is you don't have to breathe in your own strength. His word is your breath. Draw on the breath of God's word so he can breathe in you, so he can impart that life in you, so he can give you the wisdom and the instructions coded for your future, so he can show you where to go, 
So he can show you the places to avoid. So he can bring you into the newness of life. Remember, you're a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. All things. All things. But they're only going to become new if you submit to the new breath that's, that empowers this new life. I'll say that again. It's only, it's only going to become new if you submit to the new breath that empowers the new life. Don't close God's mouth from breathing into you. Don't close God's mouth from breathing into you. I'm going to say something else. Peter, you can see in Peter, two examples. You can see in Peter the example of survival breath and sustained breath. Let's go to Matthew 16. Go to Matthew 16. I want to show you this. And I believe this is for a, a select group of people. And if this is for you, I, I pray you receive it in Jesus' mighty name. I just want to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And I'm just going to do what, he, what he's inspiring me to do. Matthew 16, verse... Uh, in a second. I'm going to read it out of the NIV for clarity's sake. It says, when Jesus came into the region... Of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So here Jesus is questioning. He said, Who do they say I am? And then they begin to respond, Oh, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're Elijah, some say you're this prophet guy. Verse 15. But he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. All right. So there, he's having this conversation with his disciples about his identity. And Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, <gasps> takes a breath and gives the right answers. He took a breath from the spiritual realm and gave the right answer. See, the answers is in the breath. I'll say that again. The answers is in the breath. You don't have to come up with your own answer. It's in the breath. And because he took the breath at the right time, get this, he received an inheritance. Because he took the breath, a breath of revelation, the key revelation at that time, he received the breath, the, 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 the rewards because of his connection to the breath. But just because you connect to the breath in one moment doesn't mean that you're not obliged or responsible for not maintaining that connection. Here we see a survival breath. He took one breath, but in the same instance, he went back to a place of suffocation. He went back to a place of fear of man. Where's that at, man of God? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look with me at, at verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Hold on. Where is the breath you received a few minutes ago? Where is the breath? Well, you, you change channels. You're no longer breathing to receive continued revelation. Because if you were breathing and if you were in connection with the one that gives breath, then you would have the right perspective at what God said. See, sometimes you know you lose breath. You lose connection to God when you look at what God says through the wrong perspective. Your response to God's word will tell me whether or not you've been breathing his word in or whether you've been in a place of suffocation. If your response to God's word is receptivity, that means you're breathing. But if your response to God's word is rejection or trying to re, re, redefine his original intent, you have not been breathing. Peter was breathing when it concerned his, get this, Peter received breath to reveal his identity, but he lost breath and could not understand his process. 
He understood he was a son of God and he received breath from the Holy Ghost to, to, to speak answers and to understand him as who he is. But he lost breath and when Jesus began to reveal the process that he had to go through, he could no longer cooperate with the revelation. So he said something totally different. Don't just breathe when God is revealed to you. Breathe in the word of God when God explains the process that he's going to take you through, that you're going to walk with him on. Your breath is not just needed in the revelation of him. It is needed in the revelation of his purpose for your life, what he's called you to do, what he's called you to give up. See, a lot of us, we can, Holy Spirit just giving me a lot of revelation right now. We, we, can, we, can, we can breathe in the word of God when God tells us, oh, I'm, when, 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 when God is, when we say God is good and God is great and God is wonderful. But can you breathe in the word when God tells you the cost you're going to have to pay to experience his goodness? When, can you breathe in the word of God when God tells you that you can't do the things that you've been doing all the time? Can you breathe in the word of God when God tells you that something has to shift and change? Because the breath of God and the word of God doesn't just come to identify God. It comes to release his process in your life. But his process will not be revealed and will not be properly received if you cut off your source of revelation which is breathing in his word. I hope that's making sense. I just have to say how the Holy Spirit is putting it. So Peter, in one moment, he breathed in concerning his identity, but he cut it off and he responded negative to his process. Let me say something and I'm almost done. Satan does not threaten by you receiving the word of God and taking a breath from God every now and then. You know, he, he's not threatened by that. He just don't want you to receive it on a consistent basis. He, he just don't want you to keep breathing. He don't want you to keep breathing. He don't mind taking a breath every now and then. That's religion. I go to church, I get my quick fix, I go back to what I used to do. But if I keep breathing, if I keep breathing, now I'm living. Now I'm living for God. Now I'm connected to God. And I just want to say this in closing. For those of you that's coming on late or towards the end of this video, the only way you're going to be able to breathe is getting in the Word. Because the Word carries the breath of God. You may feel like you can't breathe right now. You may feel like you're drowning. Like there's no air. There's no ability to move. There's no ability to do anything. Let his word give you your strength. You say, I don't know where to start. To be honest, he will lead and guide you. Just ask. Just ask. That same Peter that lost his breath in the moment got it back. And you know when he got it back? On the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came, when the wind of God came, he took a big breath and he opened his mouth and he started preaching. And from that day until the day he died, they couldn't shut him up. The devil wants to shut you up. So you know what he'll do? He'll take the air out your lungs. He said, oh, you want to preach? You want to do things for God? I'm going to make you tired. I'm going to make you so worn down with the things of life. You ain't going to never open up your mouth for God no more. You ain't going to be no witness. Not when I get through with you. But you got to bit the enemy a liar. You got to say, you know what? Situations come to knock out my oxygen, to take my life from me, but I know how to breathe again. I know how to receive again. I know how to live again because this life that he gives me, I'm not losing it for nobody, no one, no trial, no situation. I'm going to breathe. And not only am I going to breathe, but I'm going to allow him to breathe through me to give life to other people. So I hope that this word was a blessing to you. I just had to be obedient to what I felt God wanted me to do. Uh, thank you for listening. I pray that this word encouraged somebody, gave you some sense of hope. Thank you. God bless you. Love you. In Jesus' name. Let's pray real quick. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your breath. We thank you that you have given us a living book 
We don't have to look to man for strength. We can go to your word and take a breath. We thank you that that breath is not just going to fill us in that moment, but it's going to give us the power to move forward, to think the way you want us to think, to act the way you want us to act, to do the things you've called us to do. So Lord, even now breathe into us. Where there's brokenness, death, decay, destruction, confusion, we ask that your breath will blow upon those dry places. Bring us out of, out of a place of death to a place of life and life more abundantly. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye.